Michelle, um, Barrister, Queen's Counsel, was head of chambers, eminent set of chambers for a significant period. Uh, he then set up his own group of mediators, some of the best in the country and the world. Uh, he has been rated uh, on the list of the top ten of mediators internationally, globally, on several occasions, as indeed has Jeff. Michelle. Si può, si può, signore, signori, scusatemi, se da son mi presento. But I could have said good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, nice to be here, but I thought after all the uh, good afternoons you've had all day for two days, that might make a change. Right. I'm very conscious that um, promoting mediation to a bunch of arbitrators is uh, anathema. And when the lawyers present as well who make their money out of arbitration, I'm the most hated person in the world. But let me uh, give you five <laughs> reasons why I think all states, and small states particularly, it's ideal that they consider mediation seriously rather than simply as a, an optional extra. First, unlike litigation, unlike arbitration, Mediation is not a spectator sport for the parties. Now you all know, you sit in court or you sit in an arbitration, the clients are somewhere there, there's a bank of lawyers in front of them, and then there's the judge or the arbitrator or the arbitrators if you're doing international with three arbitrations. If you're in court, the client sits at the back and he hears a language he just doesn't understand. The judge asks a question. Counsel turns to his junior, his junior turns to his solicitor, his solicitor then turns to the client. What's the answer? <laughs> the answer comes from the client to the solicitor, to the junior, to the Queen's counsel, who then gives the judge the answer. It bears no relation to what the client actually said. He's translated it into legalese to give to the judge. No wonder the clients think, what on earth is going on? And then when they get the result, how many litigators here have had the client say, you call that justice? Yeah, but you won. Yeah, but... The judge said this, he didn't know that, he should have known this, he should have said this. And then he gets the bill and he realises the costs, even though he's won, he still has to fork out of his own pocket a hefty sum. He's pretty well disenchanted with any form of litigation. Second point. We all know, as advocates, we just love sometimes to ring up the judge and say, look judge, you ought to know this about my client. I can't tell you this in court, but this is what you ought to know because it'll help you decide. We can't do it. You can't do it to the arbitrator. At least you can choose your arbitrator, or usually you can. But with mediation, not only can you choose your mediator, you can speak to the mediator beforehand to find out three things. One, what is his experience? Two, what experiences you have of the particular area of law if you want a mediator with that specialist knowledge. But three, most importantly, you can tell the mediator the sort of things about your case, about your client, in utter confidence, which you cannot tell a judge. And that is an advantage for the client which cannot be overestimated. And I say to advocates when I'm training them to be mediation advocates, there are three things that a good mediation advocate must do if they go to uh, earn their money representing their clients. First, find out from your client what they really must have out of any settlement. Secondly, the converse of that, what they can't live with, not what they don't like, what they just cannot possibly tolerate. And then thirdly, a list of things they would like to have out of the settlement if possible. And then I say, tell the mediator. Because if I'm seeing both sides privately, as I'm assuming you're all familiar with mediation, but if you're not, just let me tell you very briefly, the normal procedure, certainly in the UK, is that I'll have a session with each party privately first, and then I'll have an open session with, with all the parties, and then after that, it goes as if, when necessary, either privately or, or in plenary, as the, as the occasion demands. So if I, if I know from you that your client can't live with a particular issue from a settlement, I can bet your life that the other side, sooner or later, are going to say, how about this? If they launch it as an offer, 
and imme immediately with impossible. That sets back the atmosphere in a mediation more than somewhat. But if I know that that's a no-no from your point of view, I can gently suggest to the other side, perhaps that's not quite a good idea. Let's think of something else. And conversely, if there's something I know that you want, sooner or later, I might be able to suggest to, to the other side. So you serve your client's purpose through the mediator, which you would never do through a judge or through an arbitrator. Third, costs. There have been several studies on costs. None of them absolutely reliable. There's a Harvard survey which was done at the, at the request of the AAA, and they dis divided companies in the Fortune 500 countries into dispute wise and dispute foolish. Dispute foolish, we fight the so and so's every inch of the way, we never give in, and we see them dead before we pay them a penny. Dispute wise, we try and sort it at every opportunity as soon as we have a complaint. There are several issues that arose out of that survey, but the most important one, from my point of view, from the point of view of companies, is that the PE ratio of the dispute-wise companies was two and a half times better than the dispute-foolish companies. Now, PE ratio may not be important to some, but it's important to most companies. I can give you a personal one. <clears throat> I always make a point, and so does most mediators, asking parties to give me an idea how much cost they spent up to the mediation, and what the costs are going forward if they don't settle. Last year, I did 101 mediations. <coughs> 80 of those settled either on the day or within a few weeks, certainly well before trial. I totted up the costs of those 80 parties that had settled, and the average cost for both parties was half a million pounds, which they didn't spend because they settled. Well, multiply 80 by 500,000, and I make that 40 million pounds. So that's 40 million pounds which those parties did not spend on litigation going to court. Very simple, and I'm just one mediator. Fourth, mediation and mediators work on the needs and wishes of the parties rather than the rights and the remedies available in court. And it's the needs and wishes which the parties want to have settled. And most of you who litigate will know the actual dispute set out on paper, in the pleadings, in the arbitral um, claim, usually bear no real relationship to what the actual dispute is between the parties. We've all been there. And what happens when a, when a, when a chap goes to his lawyer? He wants to tell his lawyer the story. I don't want to hear the story. That's not relevant. What are the facts? What's the case? No, don't need that. I need this. Give me this. And by the time the litigation is well trundled down the path, and an expensive part of that, the client has not told anybody what he really wants to tell somebody. In a mediation, that's exactly what they do. We hear stories, just get it off their chest. They want us to understand why they are where they are. And once they understand why they are, if their opponents don't understand why they are, that's when they begin to say, well, do we need to stay here? Answer no. How we better sort it. And that's a, an essential feature and difference between uh, arbitration or litigation and mediation. And last, the fifth point, you don't get an arbitrator to tell you what the result is or judge. The parties fashion the agreement themselves. And they actually agree. And if they actually agree, then the chances of that agreement being implemented are 100%. A court-imposed judgment may often be met with a bankruptcy, <coughs> inability to pay, and somehow wriggling out of it appeals, and goodness knows what. But if the parties consensually come to an agreement, which is enforceable, and most mediation agreements are enforceable, because it's a contract, then they have no difficulty about enforcement. So it seems to me, for any small state, let alone a small state, uh, these five pointers indicate that the way to resolve disputes, quick, cheap and to the party's greatest satisfaction must be other than litigation or arbitration, forgive me. Now, anticipating, because we were at the end of the day, that um, Ash slot will be curtailed, you have in front of you uh, the, the notes that I prepared about various experiences uh, for people litigating in, in, in small states or small jurisdictions. I'm not going to read them all through, but just let me draw your attention to one one of my colleagues had. It's paragraph 4.3 mentioning earlier about how losing one case can be crippling for a small state. 
Well, this is a case that uh, a friend of mine, my colleague Nicholas um, uh, Trier, dealt with a large multinational suing a Malawi bank. Now, the Malawi bank proudly claimed it's the fourth largest in Malawi. But the claim represented 80% of its <coughs> annual profit for the previous year. And uh, instead of puffing and puffing, trying to wheedle out of it, trying to raise all sorts of arguments why they shouldn't repay, the bank officials very nicely, in a way that um, uh, Africans can sometimes do, which we can't, said, look, would you be terribly offended if we made you a very, very small offer compared to government? Because that's really all we can afford. And much to Nicholas's amazement, and I suspect the American corporation, they did a deal on a fraction of what the claim was. And so that sort of openness, that approach, which you couldn't do in court, worked in a mediation. A very simple example. I've uh, referred to a blackmail-worthy photograph to be my own particular joy. Let's see if I give you two minutes just to tell the story, because it's quite amusing. I had a mediation dispute between a family company. Younger brother, as always with younger brothers, fed up that elder brother and father were ganging up on him. He wanted out. Mother, who was the controlling shareholder, uh, said, no, they've got to keep the family together. So I was sent to a, a small a country town to uh, mediate this dispute. And um, I met the father, and I said, good morning, Mr. Sancer. And he said, Mr. Calipatis, I'm not paying for perfidious behavior. I said, I thought this was a Section 459 petition under the Companies Act. <laughs> I'm not paying for treachery. Fine. Started the open session, and uh, father walked in and said to the younger son, it's a fine bloody mess you dug for yourself, isn't it? And the whole open session, everything the younger son said, was met with a, a tart report by the father, a nasty comment, and mother sat there knitting. And this went on all morning. And about lunchtime, when I was getting a real headache, I was in a quiet corner having an egg sandwich, and the finance director came out. He said, Michelle, have you noticed a bit of tension between the younger son and the father? I said, well, now you mentioned it. Yes, I have. He said, do you want to know why? I said, if it helps. He said, well, they've both been dating the same secretary in the office. <laughs> so you can imagine the tensions there, what had to deal with it in resolving that particular dispute. Anyway, we solved it because the father rather stupidly uh, boasted that he'd been a sheriff for a particular time and he entertained a particular High Court judge. Did I know him? I said, yes, I do, to my cost. Um, he said, have you ever seen him in, in, um, in bowling gear? I said, no, I haven't. He said, I've got a photograph. Would you like it? I said, that might be useful. And so he said, I've got one at home. So I said, well, how far is home? He said, well, I've got the Rolls Royce outside. The chauffeur's there. It'll take me half an hour. I said, well, go and do it. So off he shot home, and I got the two brothers together with mum. I said, right, how are we going to solve this? And mum, for the first time, spoke. said, right, we do this, 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 and this. And that's it. She sorted it all out. Back came father with clutching this photograph of this ridiculous judge who's now dead um, in, in baseball gear, looking absolutely like an idiot. And um, mother said, sign there, Henry. He said, what well, Sign there, that's done. And that was the end of this mediation. And I had this photograph, keeping it for a rainy day when I was in the Court of Appeal. If I had in front of this judge again, I was going to work out a way of slipping it in the bundle just to teach him. <laughs> anyway, the rest of it's in there. It's bedtime reading for your amusement. And, uh, Thanks, th th thank, thank you very much, Michelle. <laughs> tales, tales from the trenches. Um, Peter, what I'd like to do is just ask two or three questions uh, of these two, bef but I'm conscious that uh, our commentators are around. Also, one or two of them have to leave. I know that uh, Nadja Alexander has to, but uh, would you allow me just two or three minutes to ask a, a several questions, and then we'll come to the commentators. Is that okay? And indeed, Petra, you may want to manage the commentators. Uh, my, I, it's above my pay grade. Um, the questions I have for the, really the two of you, power imbalances, we're, we're talking here particularly about small states. Some of them are in real uh, poverty by comparison with even medium-sized multinationals, and the bullying which can go on is very significant. Is, does, is power imbalances a worry for you in your practice? Uh, <coughs> Jeff, you see this, and so how do you deal with it? Because yeah. more so should be concerned that they go into the mediation process, and someone like GE or Rolls-Royce or whoever it might be 
will come thundering in the door and just bully them in the process into some deal they don't want to do. Mm. Yeah, no, look, it's a, it's, a, it's a concern I hear, hear a lot. Mediation, uh, in my mind, is a very people-centred process. And just beca because there's a big gorilla outside the room doesn't mean necessarily that comes into the room because it's a very people-on-people um, -people process and the parties, I think, tend to reorientate themselves. And if you're staring across the table for, you know, the day, then all of that noise tends to stay outside the room, I think. That, that may be slightly naive, but, but I do think mediation is very good at smoothing out the, those kinds of issues. And if it doesn't, then, the, you know, the, kick the mediator out, frankly. Michelle, do you about power imbalances? Yes, one does. And um, you, you spot the party that's going to throw mm. its weight around and try and bully somebody. Um, the various ways of dealing with it. First of all, I have three rules that I like parties to impose on themselves. I, I say with lawyers around the table, we have agreed nobody interrupts anybody else when they're speaking. Uh, that works well against somebody who's constantly going to interrupt and try and shut down the other side. Uh, secondly, I say, well, if we won't walk out with that, give me five minutes alone. But the third thing I insist on is first names. And it's, it's very difficult um, for people to be using first names and still be angry or still try and hector and, bu and bully. And I find that's a very useful technique for diffusing that sort of imbalance of power. If somebody is still being uh, offensive, then it's my job to intervene and take him out. Um, but normally it works. And usually people need to just have a, have a shout at the start sometimes because they need to do that. And once they've had their shout, uh, you say, yes, anything else you want to say? Um, no. There's a question at the back there. Yes, too, please. Yes, um, looking at it from a law and economics point of view, uh, the explanation for courts and why they're tax money is because they generate a public good. The idea being that if two people are in a dispute, of course they might settle it, but it wouldn't be in the interest of society, perhaps. Why not? Well, it could be a crime, uh, it could be a cartel, um, it could be corruption. Could be a government agency representing the people of a country, but not doing a very good job of it. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the decisions between parties might be quick and easy, amicable and whatever, uh, but not in the interests of the wise society. Is this a, is this a, I was just a thought that occurred to me. Is this something that's been raised or well, thought about? It, I have had said to me before uh, by some judges, um, mediation destroys the development of the common law. Well, I, I said that to Lord Berger and who is our President of the Supreme Court. And he said that's not the function of the law. Uh, if we want to change the law, we have a law reform commission for which the public pays. Why should parties fund litigation for the amusement of lawyers simply for the edification or the advancement of law? If there's crime, then usually you don't mediate that sort of dispute. But corruption, you can. Fraud, you can. Uh, any form of dishonesty, you can. Because once you analyse it and break it down, what really matters to the parties is not so much I want to expose that person, but I want to resolve this dispute because I want to get on with my life. We could hold. No, I'm talking about both the parties are yeah. committing something that is socially costly. You know, they're agreeing to something in their interests, but it's third parties that are suffering. The, the, we could hold a whole conference yeah. on that question, and it is covered extensively in the literature. I just want to quote you something from uh, Ohio State Journal, Joseph Stolberg, which I remember from time to time when it occurs to me, the meaning of justice is not exhausted by the concept of legal justice. If parties want to reach agreements, that's in the interests of good order and good government, it seems to me. So there is a case to be made. And there is immense literature on, on the subject you, you raise about power imbalance and so Dro on. Drop us an email and we can, we can yeah. um, give you some stuff. Is, well, I, and I, I wanted to raise the question with you guys. It, it, that a, a partner in my then law firm, Clifford Chance, years ago when I first got this disease, um, uh, he said, as I walked down the corridor, he says, it's all very well, Willis, but is it justice? Is it fair? And, and we're dealing with small states who have a really tough time of it a lot of the time. Is it fair for them to uh, go through this sort of process? Is it fair for them by comparison to go through an arbitral process or court process? Uh, just very brief comments from you. Is it fair what we do? do are the outcomes fair? Um, sorry, you go, you go, Jeff. Well, I think state to state uh, is difficult to mediate. That's why we don't see many investor state 
uh, mediations because it's done behind closed doors, not politically acceptable. So, I mean, I take the point there are some things that should not and are not mediated. But, you know, on a B2B, uh, there are two parties involved. I think justice is a, in a mediator's mind is a very wide concept. Not quite if you're happy, I'm happy, but I don't ever sit there in a mediation and and opine either silently or, or out loud whether that's a good or bad, fair or not fair result. Uh, you know, the parties have a whole lot of reasons where they, why they reach consensus. And the way I see the law, that's good enough, good enough for me. So I don't think it's about, it's not about fairness, it's not about justice. Okay. Fairness um, is a concept which we lawyers can argue about for six months and still not agree. What's fair between the parties is what they think is fair. As far as justice is concerned, I learned as a very young barrister when I was having an up and a down with, with a judge and being a young barrister, I was, you know, absolutely going at him. And There's he, a power imbalance. And he said, um, um, Mr. Cadabellis, what are you after? And rather pompously, I said, justice, my lord. He said, I don't administer justice, I administer the law. And that taught me a lesson. Um, Patrick, would you like to take over the management of the commentator group? Um, Nadja, I know, has to leave shortly, and maybe you should deal with, deal with, you should deal invite with Nadja to yeah. make some points uh, early on in that, uh, if I can hand over to you. Well,